I want us to become brothers again like we used to be, and for us to find ourselves and bond with each other. Can we agree to that? Opinions vary. Welcome to Three Brothers Filmcast. I'm Anton Bergstrom, and I'm here with my brothers. Anders. And Aaron. My last name is the same as my brother's. In this month, we're discussing Lee Isaac Chung's Twisters, the hit sequel that comes 28 years after the original Twister from 1996, directed by Jan de Bont. And here we go. There's a point in Twisters, where Daisy Edgar Jones' storm researcher Kate and Glenn Powell's tornado wrangler Tyler are sizing up whether the storm clouds in the distance will become tornadoes. Do they have the right amount of moisture, wind conditions room to grow against other storm cells. It would seem that conditions were just right for Twisters becoming one of the movie hits of summer 2024. It grossed well over expectations domestically, coming in around 81 million for its opening weekend. We're recording this podcast the week after the opening, and all of a sudden there are articles all over the media and internet covering different angles on the movie and why it made a splash. There are also reappreciations of the original. Is all this surprising or to be expected? That's one big question I want to investigate in this episode. Second, what do we make of the original Twister? On an early episode of this show, during the doldrums of summer 2021 during the pandemic, we made a list of 90s summer movies, and I chose Twister as one of my three picks. At the time, I admitted some trepidation, since many millennials remember the movie, but hadn't revisited in decades. It was remembered as the Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt disaster movie with the early CGI cows that whirl by in the tornado. When I put out my retrospective review last week on the original Twister, I praised the film, but admitted it wasn't a top-tier blockbuster. Now all of a sudden I'm seeing statements about it being the perfect blockbuster, an icon of the 90s. How well does the original Twister hold up? Okay, ramblers, let's get rambling. Tyler Owens calls himself the Tornado Wrangler. If you feel it, chase it! I said if you feel it, chase it! Alright, here we go. Oh, she's perfect! She's gorgeous! You thought you could destroy a tornado. We never had a chance. You want one? Brothers, let's start with this question about the new sequel, before we get to the impact of the old one. Does Twisters deserve its unforeseen success? Is it a good blockbuster? My review's already out there, so my opinion is known. But Anders, what did you think? I liked Twisters quite a bit. I think I liked it more than I thought because, and we can get into this later, I'm not as big a fan of the original. Like, I think it's, it's, it's fine, but we can get into that. Um, but I, I, I was, I liked it a lot. It, it really just kind of hit the, the right notes for me as a summer movie. I found it charming, enjoyable. I thought the special effects were good. Um, and, and of course, I think the, the, the strength of this film, I think though, is really in the characters because yeah. it, it doesn't rely on like as much as you need special effects to show tornadoes and have people like driving into a tornado and like drilling their truck down into the ground so they can like go right under it and stuff, which is a genuinely like these are cool ideas and, and has some intriguing sort of pseudoscientific uh, aspects to it. I think the real uh, charm of the film, let's be honest, is in the cast, both Glenn Powell, especially. Uh, as the lead and then uh, some of the supporting cast in the film as well. Yeah. So just one, yeah. one follow up on that. Is it your favorite blockbuster of this summer so far? Admittedly, I haven't seen a lot of yeah. movies yeah. this summer, but it's, it's funny. Uh, I just recently watched the, another legacy sequel, uh, the Beverly Hills Cop 4 Axel F on Netflix, which I also like quite a bit. I think both the films play interestingly with their, original incarnations but i do think twisters leans less heavily into this what we've often talked about in this on our podcast of the sort of legacy sequel Mm -hmm. or requel whatever you want to call it i think twister stands alone better on its own on its own uh in a lot of ways and i think that it doesn't just rely on your uh you know affection or, or whatever your feelings are about the original than most of these other legacy sequels slash requels because i think that twisters 
in some strange ways that we can we can get into i think it does actually speak to this moment in time in a bunch of different ways that that i think we will get into yeah. aaron so both both the questions right like what did you think of the new one and then where would you place it roughly in sort of the summer movies you've seen this year yeah i I'm much the same. I really liked Twisters. Um, it reminded me a lot of a 90s movie or a Spielberg movie. And it's mm-hmm, the first mm-hmm. one in a long time that just understands the visual and narrative tone that a blockbuster is supposed to have. It's not hyper serious, even though a lot of it has yeah. to do with trauma, but it's not like tongue in cheek ironic. It's not... Um, veering into that franchise of vacation weightlessness that a lot of movies have, which is funny for a movie that has a ton of like people getting sucked up <laughs> into stuff, but it's, it's just hitting the right tone. And it, um, it reminds me obviously of, you know, Amblin entertainment from the nineties specifically mm-hmm. like a Jurassic park or something, which the original twister is trying to be, but it also yeah. reminded me a lot of super eight. J.J. Abrams movie from 2011 where another like movie that's just very calculatedly studied in terms of being a Mm. Spielberg summer movie and that's the key is that like it feels like a summer movie Super Mm -hmm. 8 feels like a summer movie because Super 8 makes you want to go out and look at the stars I know a lot of people don't love that movie but I think a lot of people would think it's one of Abrams best movies oh totally I, I haven't revisited it but I really liked it when it came out yeah like I really really like it and this movie makes you want to go look at clouds, right? Yeah. Like you, it makes you want to go out into a field and just look at the storm. <laughs> I, I think I understand what you're saying. I think uh, it has a lot of that nostalgia for, uh, you know, the, the Spielberg movie. I think it taps into that notion of wonder that Spielberg movies mm-hmm. do. Um, I think that strangely, Lee Isaac Chung is really, he's a good student in a way that yes yes maybe even okay aaron i know you're gonna disagree with this but jj well can't quite do because jj also doesn't you know okay this is the big difference between super eight and twisters for me is super eight's good is about two-thirds of a great movie and the last third to me it doesn't really know what kind of movie it wants to be you know it doesn't want is it a monster movie it is a is it a sort of et goonies type thing or is it you know uh what what whatever but uh, Twisters, I think, ironically, sticks to the landing better, uh, at least in my opinion, and it feels more complete and 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 uh, and solid in a lot of ways. Yeah, but to, I, I mean, not to get sidetracked on Super Eight, but Super Eight also has the specificity of the kids and their filmmaking that yeah. is of a like intimate level that clearly is like a JJ reflecting on his own childhood totally. in a way that yeah. this movie doesn't have any of that. Like it has the Oklahoma affection and stuff, but it doesn't have those kind of specific small character moments that creep into the big blockbuster to the level that that yeah. does. It has sure. a lot Super, of good character beca- moments because of the filmmaking aspect. Super eight's more self, more obviously self reflexive. Absolutely. Throughout. Yeah. But so, to, so that's what it reminded me of the most, those movies. And the reason it's, again, it's just summer, the tone. I act, it's nostalgic without being referential. Yeah, because it also feels like a, it's nostalgic, weirdly, but also feels like a movie of this moment. Well, yeah, no, but it feels nostalgic because it's using the filmmaking modes that aren't very popular nowadays in terms of just like its camera choices, its character choices, the way it decides to introduce characters or play off things or like call back to itself. It actually, a lot of people I've seen um, online who are mixed or negative on the movie seem to be ripping the screenplay. And I'm kind of like, I don't know. This is a movie with a very sturdy structure that I'm actually like really impressed by its screenplay in a way that I, that I think the perfect comparison in recent years is the one you call out in the intro, Anton, it's Top Gun Maverick where it's like, that's just, I think Maverick's better, but it's, it's just like, this is a very solid, well done Hollywood blockbuster structure. Does this but, reveal that Joseph Kaczynski is also the guy who knows the the structure really well? Yeah, because I mean, John Legacy even's right? got it and stuff. But yeah, I don't I don't know how much Kaczynski actually had to do with yeah, the actual story that came in, but he definitely he's the one who pitched the idea of a Twister sequel. Um, but I don't know what traces remain in the screenplay. But definitely, yeah. um, I I I definitely think that like Lee Isaac Chung. From reading various articles out there, he spent a lot of time studying like other movies, uh, movies with driving, like all sorts of stuff to figure out like, okay, how would he do a movie that's that's very different? And I said in my review that, you know, I think initially there's a huge surprise of like, oh, the guy who directed Minari, you know, this sort of 
indie drama, which I really liked, but wouldn't make you think of a big summer movie. But he then he did this, but he, he clearly put in the work to study how do you do this, studying Spielberg. Um, and I think the Top Gun Maverick connection is also, it's definitely there, but the little bit of difference I'd say is that the, the nostalgia here is almost like it's elicited because the product or the, the creation reminds us so much of an earlier work. Whereas the only thing I'd say different is that Top Gun not only reminds us of an earlier work, but um, the affection for old things is like built in thematically too in a yeah. very strong way, right? Like, you know, because Maverick is this older generation pilot. And so that becomes a whole topic mm-hmm. of discussion. Whereas this movie, you're right, Anders, in that it feels like in some ways a movie of 2024, right? It's like these YouTubers, like there's mm-hmm. stuff like this that's very of the moment. It's not a movie that's like, oh, always hearkening for older times. But the craft, it's mm-hmm. like he's just like, I'm going to make a movie. Okay, someone did Top Gun Maverick. Clearly, there's an appetite out there for an uncomplicated, fun, well-made blockbuster. We don't need to have a bunch of snark. We don't need to have a bunch of like um, that sort of like ironic tone. We're just going to like enjoy it. It has a script that like it's not trying to do anything super special, super deep, but it's just going to be a tight script. And then it just goes out and like kind of just, you know, it just hits the home run by doing the simple thing, right? right. Not, by not trying to be too much. Yeah, and that's to, that's why I said in my review that I was just like, for me, it's not the best movie, you know, of the year. And, you know, last year, obviously, like my summer movie was Oppenheimer, but that's not a real blockbuster. Where this movie was like, we're going to do like a classic 90s blockbuster. And it does it. I think that you you hit on that, that it's an overused metaphor where people talk about like action movies and populist fare as with the food metaphors of like, you know, a well-made burger versus like a fine dining and things like that or something experimental. But the reality is a lot of movies people will say, oh, it's just, it's just good fast food kind of thing. It's not actually good, right? This is, this is more like a summer barbecue (laughs) with the family in the backyard that's just enjoyable. And, you know, it, it hits all those spots and, and points that you, you want in order to, to just have a good time, right? And it has enough of like, I think, if you want to talk about callbacks and sort of nostalgia bits here, yeah, you obviously have, like you mentioned in your review, the, you know, the callback to like the Dorothy and then naming the, the devices after like Wizard of Oz and stuff. And you have the sort of climax with the, the movie theater versus the drive-in in the original. Um, but, um, but those aren't like overt. They're not like, it's like you said, that winking kind of like, hey, did you get it? Did you get it? Kind of thing. Like it's just there. You could easily you see, see this movie without. You don't ever need to see. You do twister. not need to see the original, right? Like, I went with Dad, our, our father, and I and my kids, and none of, and none like, of them would have none seen of them right? have, would have yeah. seen the original or haven't or if Dad ever saw it, he wouldn't remember. I it don't at think all. he did. Yeah. Um, and they all enjoyed it, you know, because it had something for everyone in, in that way. Um, in terms of Lee Isaac Chung, it's funny. I was like, you know, when I remember, I remember when I finally re- was looking up it like a month or so ago and realized that he was directing this. I, it, I was like, what? That's so crazy. Right. But then, and then I was looking at some of the, the cast and stuff. And one of the supporting characters who's part of um, Tyler's like Tornado Wranglers crew is uh, Katie O'Brien, who uh, I haven't seen the film, but was in uh, an earlier hit this year that with, with uh, Kristen Stewart, what's it called there? And, um, Love Lies Bleeding. Love Lies Bleeding. And then I realized, I'm like, but where have I seen her before? And I realized that she's a recurring character in the third season of The Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. She's the Imperial officer yep. who is a con- the, in the episode The Convert, which is the only episode of season three of The Mandalorian that does not have yeah. a Mandalorian in it and is set on Coruscant. And Lee Isaac Chung directed that episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she's the one be- who's in a Republic person who's actually yes. like secretly bad. Yeah. <laughs> so I th- I mean, it also makes me think that that Mandalorian episode may have been him testing sort of his getting his feet wet in terms of special effects and, and stuff he, like that. He's so. definitely said that in some of the articles yeah. I've read where he was like, it helped him get sense of, get the sense of like a big set. And yeah. It makes me happy because a lot of, yeah, when you, when you see Lisa Isaac Chung's, name attached to a movie like this my initial reaction is like oh it's kind of a classic disney thing where they scoop up an indie director and throw them into the deep end and they but it's a means of taking the name recognition and the prestige that's can with this like respected filmmaker on the up and up 
and attaching it to this giant faceless corporate product, which aside from Ryan Coogler, you, you know, for the first Black Panther, the second Black Panther is an ambitious mess, but it's a mess. So um, would, would the point of comparison be, uh, so remember, this came out uh, 2020, was in the 2021 Oscar race for Best Picture. What won that year? Nomadland, directed by Chloe Zhao. Who went on yeah, to make Eternals. Yeah, who went on to make Eternals. And it was that, that's totally the person who they get, you know, the the indie director and just like complete fail at a box office black uh, blockbuster movie. Yeah, no, but it's, it's, it's actually that the filmmaker is done a disservice, but also it, they clearly actually don't really know what they're doing with the scale. But and I didn't the, feel that here. No, I didn't feel that here. That's what I'm saying yeah, is that yeah, I think yeah. the Mandalorian thing is actually a smart, it's, it's a good point uh, to bring up because it does seem like he did what you should do, which is like, okay, I'm going to move from a, a feature, you know, an intimate feature, but not like a micro, you know, budget. Like Minari is not a tiny movie. Yeah. And it's he just, made two other films before that. Yeah. Right? He, he had yeah. Uh, that movie that he made in Rwanda, which was like the first Kenya Rwanda yeah. <laughs> language Life, film. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is per- I need to watch that. That sounds interesting just in and of itself for that reason. But um, the amount of filmmakers who, you know, like they, they don't treat TV as like a, a learning pad, which I think you need to now because TV is not, ci- it's not cinema. Um, it's TV. It's, it's got a lot of similar elements to it, but like a Mandalorian episode can be big budget. And yeah. You can scale have scale and budget nowadays and lots of C- side G- CGI and stuff, but it's not, twisters you know it doesn't yeah. have that same scope in in terms of just the cinematic story like visual language and this movie funnily enough for the amount of cgi in it i think one of the best elements of it is the the blending of like real oklahoma with the storms it, the movie's actually very seamless cgi in the sense mm-hmm. that i there's nothing yeah. that seems particularly fake even though you know there's tons in there but it's also some of the stuff that's most affectionate or kind of memorable are the moments where it just seems to be, yeah, watching the clouds or the rodeo scene. That man. one obviously, yeah, the rodeo scene board, but that one obviously CGI moment in the climax when it like it's the tornado like collapsing on itself and it goes above the clouds mm-hmm. and it's just like a really like pretty shot of clouds, <laughs> right? But you see it kind of bought in the mouth yeah. through the middle of it and you're like, oh, that's like a it's a little grace moment that I think a person who's just interested in like CGI yeah. spectacle wouldn't really think about because they wouldn't be tied to this idea of like, well, I've watched how many storms in my life. What's the things that like interest me in the in the skies totally. of where I grew up? So um so I, I just I, one one thing I had read was that he actually like I, I, I don't know if enough of the details, but from reading some articles about the whole process of this, um, it sounds like he like he wanted to do this and what he did to try to win them over. Because I it, it sounds like the studio didn't necessarily be like, oh, we should get like Lee Isaac Chung. Yeah. Like for whatever reason, sort of he he auditioned himself. And what he did is he re-edited scenes from his movie Minari with parts of like tornado stuff and stuff to show how what he brings to it as someone who sort of understands like the the rural, rural landscape and countryside what he could bring to sort of like a, a movie like like this this about tornadoes and stuff so it, i also feel like he's someone who approached to recognizing his um what people would expect of him based on his previous stuff and he, in figuring out like what he can do to sort of um to grow because that, that's to me, it's like, it's not like, you know, I think Minari's a better movie. Um, but, you know, to do, a, to pull off a movie like Twister's well, you're going to have to develop new skills. And what mm-hmm. I just find great about this is like, it's someone who went out there and they figured out, okay, like, how do I do this? And then he yeah. did well. Honestly, it makes me excited for what he's going to do next. Yeah. Now, well, now I'm like, now I'd like to see what his next thing is. And like, what's it going to be? Is it going to be another blockbuster a smaller movie a prestige type yeah. movie it's actually fascinating because we live in this kind of weird cinematic environment where we almost expect um filmmakers to be static or everything like growth <laughs> is frowned That's upon yeah. but it's yeah. actually really nice to watch a filmmaker where you're like oh you've picked up some new tricks and you tried new things well and you didn't like it didn't lose the thing that makes you distinct like this mm-hmm. is still an obviously movie made by him but it's it's just um it's just interesting to me to view that because this movie shouldn't feel so novel 
And this seems to be one of the things that is like, it's super common on like the reviews. I think we all write, but especially me, like I'm, my reviews are almost constantly now in conversation with this idea of like a Hollywood in decline, because I think it's so obvious Hollywood's in decline. Um, in terms of its cultural capital, in terms of the amount of films that are made, in terms of the amount of money that or people that actually watch them. But then it's also just people always say every movie year is a great movie year. And I think that's true to an extent in the sense that there are always enough interesting movies beyond Hollywood. Yes, yes. That are worth discovering. But let's be very clear. This year has been a bad movie year. Yeah. Like it's it's this is the most 2020 was similar because 2020 had the really weird release schedule, but it actually it's, and this is partially because of the strikes and stuff. And I'm looking at all the movies. I haven't watched as many movies this year. I've been very busy, but I still watch a fair number and I'm looking and then I'm looking at the movies I missed and I'm like, the stuff I missed doesn't seem that interesting yeah, sure, or I that like innovative. With- yeah. Yeah. It's like, do I, I don't really need to catch up with inside out too. Who really cares? Like it just seems derivative, right? Like, you know, the Pixar formula, it just seems like, the first movie, but for a 13 year old, not a 10 year old, like, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, but I'm, I'm just, it's Hollywood is getting worse and the strikes made the schedule for this year more dire, but like even just going back to 2015, like oh, the man, su- 2015. you know, you had, you had the summer of like, Mad Max, then you had Jurassic World was a huge, it's not a great movie, but it was a huge hit and people were excited about it. They wanted to go see the movie. And then once you start turning around to the fall, you get Creed and then it all caps off with Star Wars, like Force Awakens and the excitement and the enthusiasm. People are very jaded now. And I think the pandemic made them jaded, but Hollywood hasn't really risen above. And how, again, however much I love Dune Part 2 and Dune Part 2, I think, is like far and away the best movie that's come out this year. And it's also one of the few, I think the Dune movies are kind of the perfect examples of what blockbusters can look like, like what the next stage of blockbuster might look like. It's like this very like thoughtful. Yes, it, that's transportive, the, the but envelope. very like tapping into our kind of tenor, emotional tenor of yeah. how we live now. It's like, it's not really escapism. It's actually like d- digging deep into our own like tortured <laughs> obsessions as a culture yeah even if it's not commenting directly on us now but like you know you watch that and you're like that is very much a movie of 2024 seems crafted for this moment but also definitive of this moment and it doesn't seem like something from the past and it's not like a novelty factor that makes it good but it's more of just like it exists as this next stage of what a blockbuster is it's not a spielberg movie or a camera yeah. movie right mm. well i do think we've lost i don't want every movie to be noon part two and so many movies nowadays seem to want to be that kind of thing, but just completely don't have the storytelling ability, the yeah. filmmaking ability, the scale, the vision, the talent simply to do it or the interest from like a studio level. And so we get just derivative films and even, you know, stuff like bad boys, ride or die, or like, I'm sure that the Anders, I want to watch the Axel F like, but I'm it's sure just, it's similar but, to bad boys. Yeah. But those are just kind of like, they're fun. But they're, they're not like wowing me. The only movie this summer that I was like, this was, you know, fascinating and kind of riveting in its own way is Fierce, Furiosa. But Furiosa flopped hard. So it's yeah, not really like. it's too weird. It's too. Yeah. yeah like it's, it's too weird. It's not Twisters too that hits the the, the, quad, the four quadrant thing. And so I watch a movie like Twisters and it seems more special than it should because it's not special. It's simply like good and adequate and it's what we should get with blockbusters because but because of its rarity now, it actually does seem special in a weird way. Hang on. You didn't say which way we were going yet. Now, from what I gather, west, we double our chances. East, well, it's high risk, high reward. Well, go for the reward. There's no one been to think you're boring. Now, boring is not usually a problem for me, Kate. Two cells to the west are fighting over the same inflow. They'll choke each other out. This one to the east is the sky all to herself. Moisture, wind shear, instability. All the things you need to give Ben a good show. Wait, I want to I wanna throw out an idea, though, about twist, Twisters, though. Because it is not really a nostalgia piece, but we feel nostalgic about it because of exactly what you're saying, that it's a sort of just, you know, solidly crafted kind of thing. But it is a film for this moment, in a way, but without being the sort of intense, 
operatic Dune type thing, right? Oh, yeah. And yet it's a film that actually pushes back against some of our cultural uh, fears or cultural things. Like, it's weird to think of Twisters as like a, I don't, I don't want to say it. It's not a political film, but it's a film that asks us to sort of reflect on how we live in some weird ways at moments, just in moments. It's not but like, it, most, but, not everyone's going to get yeah. that out of the film. But this is something that I think Lee Isaac Chung brings into it, right? So just a couple of points that I would say. One, Anton, it's a portrait of middle America that is crafted with affection and not irony or condescension. It allows people to be who they are, regardless of who they are, right? But it doesn't have a sneering kind of view toward, there's a shot of a, you know, on a rodeo with an American flag and there's no sneering about it. And yet it also you also have Tyler's crew of YouTube you know, people who is a very obviously very diverse and like you know, kind of. Uh, crew well, can of I people. Just, sorry before you finish that? There's just one other point, which is that it doesn't display the rodeo or the Middle America affection by juxtaposing it with a coastal culture that you should have contempt for. Exactly. Like it doesn't. You're, say, we're not oh, supposed to have contempt for Kate. Kate's not bad because she went to New York. Yeah. Exactly. No. Exactly. <laughs> um, second, it, it touches on uh, another hot button button issue climate and disasters and things like that right and there's the the subtle uh the you know if there is a villain in the film it might you know might be the guy who's buying up you know the the land from people who's have their houses destroyed yep. in insurance scams and stuff like that right but it basically the film like and this is maybe something we get into when we talk about the original film my recollection of the original film is that the twister is like jo- the shark in jaws it's very consciously spielberg right the twister is a monster. The twister is where here you have those moments where like Kate and um, Tyler, especially Tyler helps, you know, helps her to articulate something that she's sort of in her fear kind of forgot, right? Which is that the tornado is both dangerous and scary, but it's also something that you have to kind of live with. It's nature. There's something sublime and, and awe-inspiring about it and actually beautiful about it in a lot of ways, right? Like he says, like, you just got to ride it. You got you to feel it, right? It's like this kind of notion of like the, twi- the twister itself is not the – mo- the tornado is not a monster, and yet it's something that's clearly impacting people, and we, we're going to have to learn how to either live with it or mitigate some of the, the impacts of it in some way. That I th- and I think the film t- uh, deals with that in a way that I kind of liked, like – like my, I was a bit worried about my, my younger kid who doesn't get scared at movies like Dune and stuff like that. But like when we watch movies that have like murders and real life sort of scary things, he's always a little bit like, oh, is that going to happen? But he wasn't actually that scared of it in that way. Like he kind of was more fascinated. It, it, that fascination, that wonder with nature, I think comes out in it in certain ways. And I think that that's something that Chung also deals with in um, like Minari, like, you know, like it's not ideal. Some of these challenges say of life, but you, you, the way you deal with them is, uh, you know, through our relationships with other people and, and nobody's like a villain. I, I mean, it's kind of like, I kind of appreciated the way they like, kind of reverse their our expectations about characters in the film and, and things like that. Obviously that's like, you know, an old cliche. It's like guy who seems like a hot shot is actually gonna have a heart of gold and things like that. But it works, you know. But and then it, it doesn't fully reverse it, just so that then the person we thought was good is also exactly just no. A everybody is given a you know, or or almost everybody in the film is given a chance to, uh, you know, be a human being and not a piece of garbage. So the the movie, like, I just thought what it was its approach is like because nowadays the approach to everything is to like if you want to be political or have a message that is sort of like that has to lead the cart or you have to like bludgeon your audience with it. And then this is a movie again, like I've read some articles where it's like people have called sort of Chung out and been like, well, why don't you make like climate change that much more explicit as a thing? And he's like, well, I didn't want this to be a message movie. No, he's like this, you know, but he's like, but there's comments out there about, you know, things changing and stuff, but I'm here to like sort of observe and show the story I'm not here to push a mes- message on people. And th- in that what it, what I found interesting is just that you're like, that used to be more of the approach of, of Hollywood. It's not necessarily apolitical, but it's how you sort of approach doing your, your thing. And like, 
it's just we sort of got into a point where we expect if you have something to say, you like someone has to come out and just say it. Yes. Us. Yeah. And you're like, well, you know, this is a movie that like on all sorts of levels, people don't just come out and just like say like what we should understand in this scene. And we almost like that seems refreshing, but it's kind of sad that that seems refreshing. <laughs> but it, but it's funny because it's also like it's so obvious what they are saying in those scenes. It's just not doing it in the the blunt internet poison manner that people want or expect, which I, I get the impression from this. I don't know. Maybe Lee Isaac Chen does use a lot of Twitter, but I get the impression he's not influenced by Twitter to the way that a lot of screenwriters and especially TV writers are, which has kind of ruined a lot of millennial filmmakers in that, like they can't get the discourse out of their head. So everything becomes a reaction to the little political straw yeah. man in their brain. And this movie, like the whole, there's that whole sequence kind of two thirds of the way through the movie when Kate goes back to her mom's. And she's having conversations with her mom. And then when Tyler shows up and her mom just kind of in her little manner is, is constantly just talking about like, Oh, life's getting a little harder here. The weather's getting a little weirder. Things are just don't really make sense anymore. And I, it's like, what you know, we, it's like kind of, Oh, what, like, what can we do here? What did we do? Kind well, of stuff. It will. They, it, that she, seems yeah, she's like, she's like the, yeah, she's like, you know, there's, there's more storms. The prices have gone up. Yeah. Feed. But I'm still here is what she tells to her. Yeah. And back to Anders' whole point about this being kind of a movie that's sort of like it's there's a sense where it's like even though the movie hinges in ways on this idea of like, could we collapse a twister? Could we stop a tornado? That whole aspect of the movie is sort of like, I don't know. I'm still working out what the movie's approach is here. But you're like, it seems in tension with this whole idea of sort of like. And then there's sort of nature and nature is nature and partly to succeed or to live life and enjoy it. You have to actually just sort of live with nature. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually funny because the whole controlling the tor the tornadoes element, her taming the tornado or whatever that she calls it is again, it's a way the movie's commenting on climate change in a way that's like the way through it. The I don't know. This is just another one of those examples. Of like, I feel like the movie's, it's without being explicit, it's like super obvious, but not in a bad way, but about it's like commentary on climate change where it's like, it's obvious all these people are being devastated because there's the giant oil refineries that are poisoning the air around them and changing the habits. The people are and commenting let's be honest, on that. The fire, the fire tornado through the oil refinery is super cool. <laughs> oh, super cool. I kind of wish it was a little bit longer actually. Cause I was like, that's just a really cool visual whenever you get fire spouts and stuff, but the reaction against to, to correct climate change is not another human force humans forcing its will upon nature. It's actually more of a, like we got to learn to live with it and you intervene when people's lives are at risk, but you don't change the whole game. You know, it's not like get rid of all twisters everywhere. It's more of like, we got to learn how to predict these so we can save people when they're threatening yeah. the town or something. And that, again, that's kind of like a comment on like, well, the way to fix the climate is not to, seed the air with stuff that blocks the uvs to yeah. cool down the planet it's simply it's like maybe we should like live in a way that we're not destroying the planet <laughs> right it's like lock out the sun <laughs> it's, Mr. Burns no, Mr. Burns. <laughs> it's like taking candy from a baby <laughs> you know but it, maybe the other thing is my I, I do think funny enough my my uh, appreciation of the film was impacted by the fact that i just drove across middle america yeah my way. I'm, I'm visiting family in saskatchewan right now and I was in Saskatoon watching it and you know, this is a very prairie movie. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, you can definitely feel it's like got a, an affection for the people in the landscape of the prairie. And I, I appreciated that. Yeah. It comes out in the weird sort of like, she's like a tornado whisper. Yeah. Like she like the grass, you know, there, there is sort of like a, like he, he's leaning into sort of like a wonder aspect, but she has like a prescience. Like she can sort of like yeah. see it before. It Again, happens. that's like kind a of a nineties thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, I mean, then the influenced all the like early two thousands TV shows with like, ghost whispers mm. and all that you know all that the mentalist and all that kind of stuff but okay. but visually it allows some really nice touches where you mm -hmm. sort of like in kind of faster images you see some interesting mm. like nature stuff happen like there's a really um i can't think of the exact shot construction but she she like looks out and she sees a shift in the yeah the wind and the wheat the wind and the wheat in the way the shadow goes on that 
it's when it's, it's the two twisters. Yeah, the you have to decide which way to go. And, and then that causes her to make her decision. But it's a really sort of, it's sort of like a very strange looking image. But same thing with those those high up in the above the cloud shots, where all of a sudden you see it like, you know, in the sort of a sped up image going up or collapsing the... The anvil, yeah. It's a visually interesting movie. Yeah. It, again, it, like... I don't want to overstate things. No, I don't want to overstate it. Like, I don't think that this movie's not Furiosa where I'm like, whoa, that's like really fascinating moments or it's not Dune with like blows me May. It's more like I saw it. I had fun. I like, I was satisfied by it. I thought the action was cool. It reminded me of when there was more movies like this. So I got a little bit wistful. Yeah. And the thing that we've somehow yes, taken 30 we, minutes not we, to we talk, need it's to like talk about this. have a pro, like proper movie star in a movie. Tell the folks how you feel it. I'm feeling pretty good, man. And if you feel it, I said if you feel it, Oh, it's a beautiful day. Beautiful day. Yeah. So dad's comment about this movie after was that, yeah, I liked it. But funny enough, he said, I was more engaged with the human aspects than the the action and, and all that. I'm like, well, what we're really saying here is Glenn, Glenn Powell is an honest to goodness movie star. And he is just so charming <laughs> and so cool. Um, so my son is like literally wearing a cowboy hat because he, he's like, Glenn Powell just looks so cool in a cowboy hat in this movie. Like he's the new Tom Cruise, honestly, like he worked with, Tom, it's the all American smile guy who is like, you think he should be a douchebag but he seems so genuine that you actually just want to be his best friend. Like yep. <laughs> that's kind of the, the approach. And we came out of the movie last night and um, my wife is just like, yeah, he, he, he reminds me of Cruz cause he's always smiling and he's always like, just, he seems to like almost winking and being like, yeah, I know it's going to be fun. Like, and, he, and he's, <laughs> he does something that Cruz often does in performances is they'll they smile at someone and if they don't get the reaction they want or the situation changes they actually hold their smile past that but it slightly changes you do you only want to sort of talk yeah, about yeah, where yeah. they're like they're still smiling but now like you can tell they're thinking something because his else. eyes change as he's but still it's smiling. because they almost have a smile as a resting face like that's mm-hmm. kind of like just the the yeah. kind of a face they have what did, what did so what did you think about uh daisy edgar jones I'll say that my opinion of her like halfway through the movie actually changed and got like much better. And I actually sort of feel like the movie kind of like sets her up as kind of, like initially I was like, uh, she's kind of like a wet blanket. She's sort of annoying. Yeah. But then by the end, I sort of liked her the way she was doing her sort of um, bugging slash flirtations with, um, with Tyler, the way those, like I started to understand sort of what the character and how they operate but I also feel like it was sort of um, it's kind of like, I guess, useful to the plot for her to be a little bit like um, like she's not immediately likable. No, but that's why you're satisfied when she finally like switches teams and joins yes. Tyler's crew. And yeah. she seems much more at home, actually. And then you realize her and, you know, eventually the uh, Anthony yeah. Ramos character, too, where you're like, you both belong on the you're not the square. You're not squares. You're actually kind of the weirdos. You need yeah. to be with the weirdos. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. Also, tiny little casting thing when I realized that uh, the TV on the radio is tuned to Adam Benfe has a uh, supporting role as part of Tyler's. I didn't know that. Tornado Wranglers. I was like, afterwards. I was like, I was like, ah, oh, sweet. So I didn't know he was acting them? these days. I, I like the. Harry Haddon Patton, which is like the sort of British journalist guy. Yeah, yeah. Just getting like, and again, they don't have to make <laughs> him into some it. sort of jerk or like anything. No, he, like totally at the start. Two. At the start, like you're like this could just be kind of like um, the lawyer, like the, Brit- like the you know, like sort of like the the British ass. Like you know, Americans will often sort of just put like a British person in and be no, like this person. He's just a fuddy duddy. But by the funny. end, he's actually like in the final scene, he's like helping people and he's exactly. sort of like become part of the team. You know, and, and I know maybe it's shameless, but like some of the stuff, like when, when you realize that, you know, the, the tornado wranglers team, like, like, you know, oh, you're just selling t-shirts and, and no, but the food is all free. That's why do you think we sell so many t-shirts? And, you know, of course, Tyler has to rescue a dog, you know, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you're just like, oh man, they're just dog? so good. <laughs> Neither of you guys have seen Hitman, but it's, it's no, actually fascinating watching this movie 
after seeing Hitman because it really is the summer of Glenn Powell. And both roles are actually have a lot of similarities because Glenn Powell projects as this like macho douchebag, which he's kind of the perfect cool douchebag in, in Maverick. Like he's just smiling with his aviators and he's just like the complete ass rival, but he's such a cool guy. And he's also a good enough guy that he comes in to save them at the end too. Mm -hmm. Or you're like, he's, I, I actually, not to get all Maverick, but I love the fact that in Maverick, you're like, okay, they're going to be like, they're going to get away at the end. They have to be saved. It's like, but Miles Teller and Tom Cruise aren't the only cool guys in this movie. And it's like, no, 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 don't worry. We didn't forget. There's one more cool guy that we have to insert into the finale just so he gets a cool moment because we know that like, even though he, within the narrative, he should be the rival. It's like he's Glenn Powell. So he has to get <laughs> his like well, cool. And I don't fighters. think you guys thought, but even like uh, anyone, but you, his rom-com with Sydney Sweeney, like it. it's a totally in many ways, forgettable cookie cutter, you know, like rom-com type thing but again he's just so charming it just elevates the movie above forgettable you know but the, the thing i was saying with the comparison with with hitman why this movie actually shares it and why his link later bona fides mm -hmm. are very important because his kind of earlier breakthrough is everybody wants some he's one of the like baseball player oh, jocks he's in that. Yeah, yeah okay yeah. yeah he's the guy with the mustache okay um and glenn powell is a super like hunky macho guy but he's characters are always really really smart yeah and it's actually like he's, dumb, he's a bit of a nerd in a jock body but he acts like a, still the cool guy and that's the huge thing in hitman is that he is this like nerdy philosophy prof who once he starts role playing he realizes he can look the part he can act the part and he's like hey why don't i just be this guy all the time now like that's the whole thing with hitman hmm. it's like, Aaron, I can what, just you're, play what you're suggesting to me is that he needs to make a michael bay movie <laughs> Oh, no. I mean, but Tom Cruise needs needs to make a Michael Bay movie, too, because imagine if Michael Bay was filming Tom Cruise running. I think the cinema would explode in terms of the kinetic <laughs> energy. No, but you've always commented that there's that archetype of like the, the sort of John, like smart, nerdy guy. No, it's that, true. You know, he's he's the, John. He is in the, the Bay movie. He is, yeah. in the Bay. He is, yeah. he is solving the dialectic. He is truly clarifying it between the nerd and the jock and the ultimate synthesis. <laughs> but the Linklater Cage thing, and you're Connor. Right. gives him that the Linklater intellectual, thing, the Linklater thing that gives him an authenticity, right? Yeah, like and and so in that sense, the other actor that I think we might and maybe it's because of the, the Texas thing too is McConaughey, right? There's a touch yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. Well, the other comparison the charm, I've the heard. Charm with him is and this is more with regards to hitman than this movie but the other is brad pitt it's because he super handsome almost like supermodel ish looking but he also has um the comic aspect to the way he likes to play things and a desire to almost go into character actor mode where he is like even though i'm a movie star and the protagonist i'm not i'm not scared to be like playing a character right now and being a little bit like goofy or weird in a moment. And you get that in a few moments here where he's like really putting on the like <laughs> cowboy shtick, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the early scenes when he's being recorded and he sh first shows up and they whip in there. And it's like, who are these, <laughs> this asshole? And he's just like, all right, folks, we're going to be riding this out there. And like, he's just playing a complete goof. Um, so the movie, let, like, like that's the thing where like, these aren't, I'm not going to say like the, the, the two leads are, you know, extremely rich, deep characters. No. But they're allowed um, more subtleties at, at times where, you know, the character actually has, they have little bit of changes or they show the different sides to, to the other character. And that's partly how it builds sort of the romantic relationship between them. What did you think? I will say I'm disappointed that the movie never consummates any of the romantic stuff. Like, oh, yeah? Okay, why don't let's, they get kiss at the end? let's get into I that. I actually wish they did. I know that I think it's cute her thing of like if you want it get like chase it or whatever, like that it's cute at the end when he she he like follows her in the airport and then yeah. and it's this kind of like oh are you gonna set up a sequel where like they're gonna do more stuff together and you're finally gonna get the f that would be an interesting next step I think a movie of like about them as an actual duo as opposed to these foils that kind of end up together, which they probably will. It's making a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but eighty million is a pretty big opening weekend. There are. There is one shot in the movie when they actually just like there's a there's a moment where it's just like it, there's the, the backdrop of like the fields and everything and the wind hits and it, they're framed perfectly. And I'm like, you got to kiss. Come on. <laughs> Why don't you kiss her instead of talking to her, Dave? How was I? 
Why don't you kiss her instead of talking at her death? Want me to kiss her, huh? Oh, you just wasted on the wrong people. Well, so they, they apparently they did shoot uh, a kiss at the end. Oh, and then in the they, airport. Yeah, but actually, guess uh, so. Like, I guess, like Spielberg talked to him a different. I guess, I guess Spielberg recommended they don't do it. I don't know hmm. if that's his ultimate decision. As executive producer, um, yeah. And it's, but it's interesting because it is one. It is one way that this movie isn't a '90s movie or something. Yeah. Because it would have to end with them kissing. But I, what I, I guess what I sort of liked about it goes is against that the I feel like the movie. What I just find interesting is the movie clearly is it's clearly doing classics kind of like romantic comedy stuff where you start as like enemies and explore their interests through that conflict. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, cause then other people are sort of, you know, like online, they'll be like, so is this like movie trying to avoid having any sort of romance? And you're like, no, no. Like this is, they have a romance. It's just, they don't kiss. Yeah. But I do think it's somewhat of a, one of the ways that this movie is in line with many blockbusters now is of certain sexlessness. Yeah. Like yeah. we get him in a tight white t-shirt. We don't have him take it's not as erotic as Maverick. <laughs> yeah. Frankly. Like we don't get there's no scene where it gives a good ten seconds for the ladies in the audience to be like, whoa, he's cut. There's or no and there's no scene, yeah. And yeah, there's no this scene was a 90s where with movie, her where they, it's like, they whoa, would she's really gorgeous, scene, right? you know, like, like where it's yeah. like the wow, her hair in the wind and stuff. Like it it doesn't really enjoy that because i think there is a i'm not saying chung's this way but i think filmmakers nowadays are very sensitive to the fact that gen zers especially are like really uncomfortable with basically any hint of like eroticism on screen you're like, like to the I, point I, of I being like that, we should just cut out all sex scenes this is like christopher nolan was like i'm gonna push you and have him naked scenes in my movie <laughs> it is yeah, so it is it uncomfortable like, for you you're, you're very right in that that's that's something that's very like 2024 because I, I do think like if this was in the 90s and this was sort of the same plot, you you would have it would be a PG-13 movie. So you wouldn't actually have a sex scene, but there'd be like an implied yeah. or, or yeah. things like that. Well, I, it's not even it's not even a sex scene. It's it's simply the fact well, that I think in I the think 90s, what, would be, but yeah. what no, but what movies need to get back to is an understanding that part of the appeal of movie stars as movie stars is that you get to go watch them and be like, wow, that person's really good looking. Like that's a, that's not a gross thing. It's a part of the appeal. It's like there's like an aesthetic enjoyment of like this is a beautiful person doing cool things in a big spectacle that I get to watch, and it's not just this kind of like weird chasteness where I, I <laughs> yeah I don't need the Michael Bay leering shots of <laughs> Daisy Edgar Jones or or yeah she's Glenn like Powell. working out on her bike at the beginning like <laughs> yeah exactly the Megan Fox shots where you're just kind of like okay this, this is, is uncomfortable. <laughs> Well, no, the, my favorite uh, moment in Transformers, almost uh, aside from the racist robots in uh, Revenge of the Fallen, where you're just like, how did this ever get past like any of the like people Even in the tech department? Yeah, in 2009. But it's at the end of the first Transformers where um, Shia and Megan Fox are like making out and clearly like, it, you know, it go the camera goes up over the tree, implying that they're like making love on top of Bumblebee, and I'm like, Bumblebee's <laughs> his buddy. Like he's so is this a threesome? <laughs> Like this is a really weird relationship with your car, pal. <laughs> like, um, so I'm not saying it needs that. I just, uh, it's actually something I love about Hitman, is that it's a movie that's like, no, the characters are like attracted to each other and like want to have sex, and like that's a part of the plot. It's like there, there is a erotic tension and fascination with the fact that like oh these are people discovering aspects of themselves that they like quite weren't aware of and now we as an audience are like very aware of it and you're like okay there's a play and attention and it's it's fun to watch um again it's it's a twisters movie i'm not expecting that i just it's a it's a element that the movie i think in the 90s would have had yeah more of that yeah, i think that's actually a, think the original that's a fair comment absolutely the original, the original doesn't twister movies not that much but it's a pretty but but that's because of the the original setup is right like they're they're you know, they're exes and then they get back together. It's, it's the, his girl Friday, the, the reunion of the marriage, but, um, but it does end with the kiss and it's a very pronounced kiss and they're ignoring everyone else, but uh, maybe as a bridge to talk about the old one, but so the nineties one, one of the best features of it is as an amazing supporting cast mm -hmm. and hanging out with the crew is one of the pleasures of that movie. This movie I thought had a good supporting cast, but it doesn't, in my view, come close to sort of like topping that in any way, the nineties. But I don't know if there's anyone you wanted to point out. Did you notice that the girl from Mad Men 
Was it the star of the movie? Yeah, yeah. Karen, Karen Shipka. Shipka. Yeah. yeah. I was actually kind of hoping she wouldn't actually <laughs> bite it. I know that like people, I feel like younger people are surprised when she dies. So it's almost like one of those things because she, because she's a fairly big. Well, she was in now. the um, Netflix uh, <clears throat> Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Yeah, so. yeah. But like, so I think it's almost one of those like, you know, you suspect that this character is going to be like a main character and then. And then when they die, no, but the original one, you're right. It has like you know Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Carrie Seymour Hoffman is the best in it, but it has yeah, it has a great it has a great cast. Carrie Elwes, um, people like Nobody's Alan Rock, smarmy, just like all sorts of all sorts of good side characters. No, but this so this one you get yeah. I mean Anthony Ramos. Uh, I thought Sasha Lane Bimpe, like, was fine. Yeah, like, like, Katie O'Brien and Brandon uh, Perea. Tindale Bimpe, but they're not. You're right. The same. Uh, I appreciated the little nod to. Uh, what's her name? Uh, the mother, uh, Maura Tierney, another a '90s actor, right? Yeah, she's From pretty ER and stuff. Like, which is another little nod to Michael Crichton initiating the original and stuff. <laughs> yeah, like I like. Um, I guess the characters. I don't find many of the side characters that they're good. They're yeah, like they're, they're not, good supporting like, characters, but they're not like super. They're not memorable in the way that they were in the old one. But they're um, also not super obnoxious. Which no, usually they're not. A, a movie of 2024. No offense. Yeah, but like usually, like nowadays, I just like hate half of the supporting cast. Yeah, but I just really absolutely. want that drone that she has. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's really, <laughs> the pretty yeah. impressive drone too. Yeah. The um, but Anthony, did you notice the one uh, nod to the original is having uh, Bill Paxton's son? Is yes, the, uh, the annoying the, guy in the hotel. Because <laughs> every disaster movie has to have someone just be kind of yeah. like a smarmy and annoying, and then they have to die, and that's like. It's very much understood that you're like, because you were so rude there, you deserve to be horribly killed. Oh, but it goes further. It's it's not just rudeness, right? It's it's also like specifically like you are being a jerk within a customer service interaction. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like this guy is trying to be nice to you in the midst of a disaster and you are to being be a fair, complete To be fair, his father was very good at playing really annoying characters. I mean, like, you know, I mean, true lies. This is the ultimate... <laughs> Oh man, he's so good. Just so his good, way so of good. delivering some lines in that movie is just I can't. But even aliens, it. right? Like he, he Paxton, as much as he was Cameron's friend, Cameron knew how to like milk oh, yeah. him for that. Yeah. But I actually will say that one of one of the big in so looking back at Twister compared to this movie, I was I love Bill Paxton. And I, I, I think Helen Hunt's like pretty good, like a pretty good actor across the board. She's usually good in things. Not like I think of her tons i think of her usually in like you know in, in context of like this or as as what gets. women want or as good as it gets or something right like that or your favorite kind of show mad about you <laughs> speaking of paul riser who shows I just up always again think of the, in uh, uh, beverly hills cop <laughs> i just always think of the the seinfeld where uh george is like <laughs> it's like i, I taped mad about you you gotta come on oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> to sort oh, of show like boring uh boring romantic uh boring marriage <laughs> yeah no it's it's that However much I like Bill Paxton, and I really do like Bill Paxton, I generally prefer Bill Paxton as a supporting character yeah. than a yes. lead. And if I'm comparing his character in Twister to pals Tyler in Twisters, I'm like, I'm more interested in watching more of Tyler because <laughs> he's just cooler. <laughs> and I actually think that's a thing where this movie, it's a different dynamic because you're not supposed to be awed of the characters in the original in the way that you are in this one. but I. I'm generally more, yeah, more enamored. There's a reason why the supporting cast in the original does more of the heavy lifting. Yeah. It's not because Paxton's not great. It's just more of the, um, the character the is not character meant to is. be, you're not meant to be enamored of him in the same way. Well, I would say that in the original, um, rewatching it a few different times over the past few years, I do find that Paxton's character, he gets, he gets bogged down so much in his romantic relationship with Helen Hunt's Joe that you kind of almost forget that he's like someone who knows tornadoes is supposedly like this expert was the most in one of the stories they tell in their sort of camaraderie around the table, how wild he was going out into tornadoes. We never really get a sense of like him doing that. Um, whereas, you know, Helen Hunt's Joe is the one who is sort of more is more involved with the weather stuff in the, the actual movie. But um, well, okay. So we're already starting to talk about, you know, Paxton in the original Twister. Why don't we, I put the question to you guys, like, what is your opinion on the original Twister? When is the last time you saw it? You know, Anders, I remember going to see with 
see it with you in movie theaters in 96. I think it was the Anthony, second run movie. I'm going to be honest. I might've only seen it once since then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I so think it's, I, my recollection is that it's fine. And I've never had an antith- antipathy toward it. Um, but, you, but I've have also you never, never had affection. I've never had a deep affection for it. Yeah. Because the movie for me that summer that I loved was Mission Impossible. Mm. Speaking of Tom Cruise, and then Aaron, I mean, you you and me famously sparred on our. Uh, yeah, I don't need to, I don't need to rehash it, but I I stand by that. In that, so as a as a kid, I'd never watched the movie in theaters. I was very scared of Twisters as a kid. You lived on the you prairie. Guys can you can speak to it? Like I was tornadoes were one of the things that scared me the most. I'd get really terrified whenever there was like a big intense thunderstorm. And I'd be like very worried that a twister was going to come kill me. Um, twister, twister. Well, but then also remember as a little, really little kid, I wanted to be a twister because yes, I saw a that one. A whirlwind, yeah. You didn't <laughs> I saw that old cartoon. You could wear. Yeah, I'd put on a suit and turn into a whirlwind. <laughs> so the, maybe the Chinese will invent that technology one day. <laughs> um, interesting psychological reading there. <laughs> Honestly, the the advertisements for Twister might have contributed to me being scared of Twisters <laughs> in the way like, that what, I was six years old. Like, yeah, <laughs> I was very scared of cannibals when the trailer for Hannibal was out because I just I remember seeing it late at night once when I was like ten, and I was like, "This seems terrifying." The idea that he would eat somebody's brain that seems so scary, and I'd be like really worried that somebody was going to eat me. <laughs> Well, no, but Twisters, um, growing up on the prairie, it's a real thing. I remember hearing stories from the family. Plow but remember also, the plow wind, man? Yes, but also the 1988 tornadoes Edmonton. that hit Edmonton. Seven tornadoes or something like that. Like, yeah, yeah, and that was, that's a great example of like the kind of the, the lore around tornadoes, right? If you live in an area where they sometimes hit, then people would be like, oh, yeah, like, you know, there was hail uh, balls, you know, the size of like baseballs, baseballs and like things like that. Yeah. But like I remember, I still remember the yeah the the plow wind that like ripped all our shingles off, pl- just devastated the roof of Father Robinson the, uh, Elementary School, and like the, all the hail like destroyed Mom's flowers. And I just remember that after like that afternoon it was getting so dark and going out on the on the the green driveway sky. on Kenderdine, and it was like the sky is like bright green. Yeah. It's like terrifying. <laughs> I remember uh, once. I don't remember how old I was, but back when we were on Kenderdine before there was any developments across. I remember seeing like a tornado in the far distance. It never actually hit Saskatoon at that time. I never actually seen a full spout go down. I've seen funnel yeah. clouds, but never like the full touch, the down. full down. Um, never but experienced yeah, my, my, the thrill of touch. My down. thing with Twister comes down to, so in terms of nineties disaster movies, the other 96 movies way better. Independence day. The side, the CGI doesn't really hold up that well. I really like Philip Seymour Hoffman and the side guys. I like Bill Paxton. Yann de Bont is decent at action, but it's very reliant on this kind of novel CGI that I don't think really holds up. Yeah. And it just comes down to, I find, despite the fact that Twisters uh, ties a lot of the character motivation into trauma and stuff, the original and its treatment of the Twister as a monster is so stupid to me. Like, I, I just, I can't, get over how dumb it is that the character's motivation boils down to I'm going to kill the twister that killed my father. And <laughs> it's just it's like again, it's a twister. It's wind. It's never the same storm. It's not the same wind system. That's not how human the, psychology works. <laughs> but she's a scientist. So like what I mean is that there is you you could be devastated by twisters, want to destroy twisters and make up for it, but the movie goes up does absolutely everything except for have her explicitly say those words to the point where you're like it doesn't need to because she's literally like i am getting revenge and it's just like no that well i I would say that really stupid yeah but i'm gonna say that anton it doesn't matter that i actually disagree with Aaron. if it is emotionally compelling as a film it works because i don't think it's emotionally compelling though that's what i'm saying (laughs) i just think it's a way of like we have to justify why the character is so obsessed with this and then it becomes like a rote wave, just like it pushes yeah. back on it. But it never, the movie is dumb in a way that I think, again, it's not like a terrible movie. I just think it's kind of like a classic dumb 90s blockbuster where it's like, I have fun watching it because it's well made and stuff. But, and it's got a good cast. But is it a good movie? I don't think so. <laughs> rewatching it, like, I think it's good. And I think it just sort of does its purpose. I think that, like, rewatching it, the very first scene is really weirdly like a re 
a reworking of um, the tornado scene in Wizard of Oz, like very distinctly in a lot of different ways with the little dog that they're trying to get and then going outside to go, you know, to go into, into the shelter, this, yeah. the shelter, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I think the whole engagement with sort of cinema history is a big thing in it. And it definitely is taking the tornado and trying to make the tornado kind of like the shark. I, I do think that that's also like a self-conscious aspect of it. Um, but for me, I just, I always thought that Twister also, it was shot on location in Oklahoma. It's a movie that I find has a lot of good atmosphere. The supporting cast, it's like, there's times where the movies like just feels good to sort of hang out in, in the way it sort of captures, you know, summer, tornadoes, storms, all that sort of stuff. Um, but maybe my other question to you guys would be like, in terms of disaster movies, so neither of you are that I'm, I'm by far the warmest on the original Twister, but what, what are some of your favorite like 90s disasters movies then? Oh, I just Independence, Independence, so Independence, Day. Day. Independence Day. What, but what else? Like, you maybe what, if I'm you're gonna, even going to get into some of those Armageddon. Armageddon. Completely in Armageddon, man. Armageddon. Yeah. I like Do you think, Armageddon. Are, like, you like Armageddon? Yeah, I think it, it, if you're talking, it is. Uh, but you're talking enjoyable. about like stupid motivations. And yeah, stuff. Absolutely, Michael absolutely. Bay. Work. Anton, it's called a mastery of tone. It's awesome. Michael Bay know. masters his tone in a way Jan de Bont does not. I will have and to the filmmaking it. verve actually matches the stupidity. So it's but yeah, I, because I, the so. character is so hateful. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard when you like. I distinctly remember watching Armageddon in movie theaters, and even at that age of like you know because that would have been like grade seven or eight whenever it came out. And like, right. you know, it's a, it was a strong feeling of like, uh, what is this? This is stupid. Like very Anton, early in Anton, the movie and not like, I saw Armageddon twice in theater in summer night. <laughs> saw it twice. Oh my goodness. Okay. But okay. Armageddon. But okay. What about, have you guys seen some of like the kind of like the second tier ones again, like, you know, Independence Day. Um, I haven't Deep seen Impact Volcano. Or, awesome. Have you seen Dante's Deep Impact? Beat? I like actually Deep Impact, Deep Impact so the good. Comet movie, or, um, what's, or I guess Armageddon's the other one. Um, have you seen Dante speak? Yeah. No. It's pretty Volcano. good. You know, when I rewatched I think it, I thought it was Tommy okay. Lee Jones. Outbreak is okay. I didn't see Volcano. I, I, I find see. Outbreak similar to Twister actually, where there's like elements of it. I like, I'm, I find Donald Sutherland's villain really memorable. I like the scene where Kevin Spacey like is working in the lab and his like, suit breaks and he's like ah oh, he's been affected by the ebola like you like freak out because it's like really scary but again that movie's got some pretty like kind of fabulously stupid elements <laughs> yes but i guess that's also like that's part of being yeah most but anton, most non-spielberg anton, even some spielberg 90s yeah. movies have very stupid stuff and but anton can we also acknowledge the greatest disaster movie is also a 90s movie titanic it is well, it's a disaster movie. Absolutely, it is. It is. It is. It's incredible, and it's like one well, of the I best would ones ever made. Jurassic Park also is a yeah. disaster movie. Yeah, to an extent. In, Anytime in, in, you have nature as sort of the the opposition. Yeah. Well, Creighton makes in Jurassic Park. Creighton takes the the preoccupations and themes that often underwrite like the disaster genre, and he makes them very explicit. Like characters talk about, can you control nature? Things like that. Um, but the way it operates, in the way you see. Um, things breaking down and sort of the inevitable problem. In that sense, it operates like a disaster movie. And Aaron, the, what about your favorite 98 Godzilla? <laughs> I mean... First, first 40 minutes. No, I... But Emmerich, I actually enjoy, and I in, even enjoy, like, his 2000s disaster movies. Like, I, I think 2012 is, like, fun. It's a, it's for... It's such an insane scale. The shot of, like, Woody Harrelson on the hilltop being like, ah, is that crazy guy and getting, like, blown away by the super volcano? And you're like, it, but it's okay. a movie also that, like, exceeds its CGI abilities even at the time. Even in 2012, like... Because it's trying to, like, have them, like, take off an airplane while, like, yep. there, the, there's an earthquake and, like, the earth is opening up beneath them. And it's just, like, they can't actually pull off the special effects, yeah. but you have to appreciate it how over the top he's trying to do it. Do you think it's kind of funny that disaster movies are cyclical and they always are tied into some kind of um, burgeoning economic crisis? It almost happens, it seems. Be well, because so you got the seventies with meteor and all an airport and all those movies yes. that come out of the like economic inflation but crisis and oil crisis in the nineties, you get the, um, the housing crisis leading to the dot com burst. And then now in the aftermath of like Trump and stuff and climate, we're starting to get it again. <laughs> I just think that the 90s ones, like, so the 70s, it would be more like direct response to those things. I just find yeah. the 90s always weirdly almost like anticipating things that are a few yeah. years ahead in weird ways. 
It's Anton. It's the it's the uh, hyper normalization sequence where it's, I, it's like fairly nine eleven was already mediated through movies, yeah, right? Pre- collective, uh, yeah, yeah pre mediated. There's a collective, yeah, like it's. Like well, remember, the, they will movie be- mindset. Movies are real, and so we're just all tapping into the great uh, subconscious movie. Very young, yeah. <laughs> but also <laughs> nowadays, and we're talking about we're talking about nineties nostalgia, right? And um, when we're talking about twisters. It is, there is something going on there in the sense of like what we now think of as kind of like a golden age, the 90s. It was. Um, yeah, no, it's great. It was a great time to grow up in like pre-smartphone. All, all sorts of reasons, right? Very, obviously there's you bad still things have in every the internet. decade ever, but you're like, control your brain. <laughs> your geopolitical stuff, relatively controlled. But like, there is something weird going on when that, in, in that period of such kind of like domestic stability in North America, that there's this like collective fascination with scenes of the model breakdown before it starts to break down. But Anton, so let's cycle it back again. The 1950s had that. Yes. But the, it's, the, it's style disaster movies was the monster yeah. disaster movie. In Godzilla, the alien, in the them, aliens. aliens, Day yeah. of the Earth Stood Still, all that kind of stuff. The, the ants, the giant ants. Them. Yeah, them. them. Them's great. Yeah, no, it's actually great. It's nuclear fears. It's the idea that somehow the stability that you're currently experiencing or the 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 world that is the the slow degradation that you're witnessing is precipitating a larger collapse on the horizon and it is almost like an extension of your societal angst and fears metabolizing into this <laughs> disaster that brings it all to the fore and i feel like that's true 50s 70s 90s and now where that's why it gives the sense of almost premeditation and that's why now, because we're much more explicit and literal with things, we've made it largely about climate because we are aware now of the degradation and it's hyper front and center in a way that it might not have been, and it, or maybe only was in the 50s with nuclear stuff, where like we know directly we did this thing and it can have this impact because we've witnessed it. And now we're going to watch, like, are we actually driving off a cliff now? And then well, and that's what makes Oppenheimer imagining kind of an driving off the cliff. Yeah, uh, kickoff to this era too, too, in some ways. Yeah. It's a disaster movie in a way, especially in the final lines. <laughs> in forecast, there's something the going on within the mass line. subconscious. Uh, subconscious. <laughs> well, but then it's like it's a weird intersection between kind of like the view of sort of um, where the where the an impersonal view where sort of everything's culturally conditioned, combined with kind of like a Jungian almost collective unconscious, where there's things beneath the surface on a collective level that will like manifest themselves and in the stories we tell. But it's also the hyper commercialization, right? Is that we, we create this giant reaction against our own collective stress, but then we watch it as entertainment. (laughs) And it's, and it's kind of like, you're supposed to get a kick out of it, not to think too seriously because disaster movies are actually B movies and they're very like unserious. It it is weird that one of the most, uh, what I would describe as sort of uncomplicated fun movies I've watched in the, past couple of years is a movie about one of the few movies that's actually about like natural phenomena that do actually affect people and actually do destroy things but for some bizarre reason it seems like more refreshing and fresh than all the other stuff in cinema but that's what i mean it's like compare it to dune 2 where it's like the weird vision of ten thousand years in the future and like is it more psychic haunting humans at reality? warfare with giant yeah. worms and stuff? That is like very hyper serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's something comforting about nature in that sense, <laughs> even if it's scary. And it's like the scenes in Jurassic Park, right? When they just sit there and look at the dinosaurs and you know that it's going to happen, but it's beautiful too. But it's because it's transcendent and because it points to the idea that actually there is a control beyond ourselves, which I think Lee Isaac Chun being also like a Christian filmmaker that's built into his, his, his worldview. It's, he really does believe that like there is, you know, nature and family and human connection is, is pointing towards this idea that like, no matter what fears you're coming against in life, there is something calming and like in control that you don't need to be scared about. Um, which I actually think is a really nice attitude to have when you're doing a movie like a disaster movie. Cause then it means you're pitching the tone in a way that, is is fun but not fright like it's not f- alarmist or frightening in the way it's like it's- or, or exploitive yeah what do you see okay, already has a nice structure moisture levels are just right and lots of cape what else are you seeing flow is clean pulling tons of warm moist air from the south and when that warm air and moisture bust through the cap it explodes in the atmosphere creating an anvil the vertical wind shear begins to rotate the updraft, forming a mesocyclone. Here's the mystery. 
We don't know how a tornado forms. We see the hook on the radar, but... What are all the invisible factors coming together? Every little detail that has to be perfect. And it's a mix of what we know and everything we can't understand. It's part science, part religion. Well, who knows what other uh, good movies might surprise us this summer. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Goodbye, Mr. Bond. I bid you farewell. <laughs>